Welcome to Air Crew Interview. I'm Mike Young, your host, and in this interview, we chat with Air Commodore Paul Godfrey. In this episode, we chat about his time flying the Harrier GR7 and his US Air Force Exchange Tour flying the F-16CJ in the Wild Weasel role. I want to thank our sponsor, Flying Graphics, who produce high-quality aviation t-shirts and offer a wide range of aircraft and styles to choose from, such as jets, warbirds, rotary, transport, their iconic collection, plus much more. They have sizes from small to 4XL and offer worldwide shipping, so make sure you head over to their website at www.flyinggraphics.com to check out all their great designs. So Paul, when did you first become interested in aviation? You know, I think there is a defined point. Uh, it was 1978, clearly before you were born, <laughs> um, and it was the Kenny Air Show. I was really lucky. I, I grew up, um, it's just up the road from here actually in Gatwick, okay. um, but Kenley Airfield was a Battle of Britain airfield and my parents took me to uh, an air show. Now thinking back, it must have been you know, sort of 50th anniversary of the RAF. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw a bunch of aeroplanes and I saw the Spitfire and Hurricane there. And, uh, you know, I vaguely remember tugging my dad on the, uh, on the sleeve and saying, ah, this is what I want to do. Um, and then from that time got obsessed with uh, the Second World War, you know, building little models. My dad had built a bunch of models that were up in my room, you know, Major Smith's Hurricanes, you know, we had the whole um, Second World War going mm -hmm. on. So that's how I got into it. Eventually joined the cadets and, uh, and learned to fly around here and, uh, and that was it. Brilliant. So what year did you actually join the RAF? I joined in 91. So mm -hmm. I left school in 1990. Uh, I uh, did all right at my A-levels, but um, I forego university. All my friends went to university. It was my backup plan to go if it goes wrong, and it still is my backup plan to go <laughs> uh, when it goes wrong. But um, yeah, I was lucky I got what was called a sixth form scholarship uh, into the RAF. So you go through the full selection. Yep. They gave me a flying scholarship and some money towards sixth form. And actually, I used that money to get my uh, private pilot's license. Okay. Just up the road here, at, uh, as I mentioned, at Redhill, which was brilliant. There's me flying a little Cessna at 17 years old before I could drive a car. That's because, crazy when you think about it, isn't it? <laughs> it's ridiculous. You know, my son's 19 years now, uh, 19 years old now. There's no way I'd let him near an aeroplane. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So tell us some of the aircraft you started training on. So uh, after the, because I'd done that uh, PPL, because I'd done the time on the Cessna, um, I didn't have to go through the flying, gra the flying grading, EFT as it was called, their elementary flying training uh, with the RAF on the chipmunk. I, weirdly, I came back to the chipmunk later on in my career, but uh, I went straight onto the Jet Provost and the course I was on uh, at Linton on Ooze, once I'd done officer training, I then went up to the, uh, the Jet Provost 5, the JP5, which was amazing. So again, 18, 19 years old, being let loose in a, uh, in a jet aeroplane that did uh, just over 300 miles an hour. Um, I pinched myself every day, you know, thinking about that. Mm -hmm. it, was, uh, it was brilliant. Awesome. And let's talk about your first frontline aircraft, uh, it was the Harrier. What were your first thoughts on the jet? Um, Honestly, I was so excited when I got posted to the jet. Uh, I then, before you even get to the aeroplane, uh, we did the best flying course I think I've ever done, which was three two-hour trips on the Gazelle helicopter. Oh, wow. Learning how to hover, essentially. And it was the greatest course I've done because you didn't have to learn anything. You just got in this helicopter. The instructor did everything. He turned it all on. And he, you then tried to take it off and then, uh, then go fly around the place. And, and you were getting quite advanced by the end of uh, the sixth hour. Uh, so that was brilliant. But then you turn up and, you know, with the aeroplane behind us, the, the, um, they had just gone. The GR3 had gone. However, they still had the T4, the two-seat version of this. And uh, I was just saying to you before, uh, you know, when we were talking about the cockpit and this one, I remember looking in the cockpit on day one of this two-seat Harrier and thinking, I am never going to be able to do this because it looked like they'd coated the cockpit in glue, thrown a bunch of switches and dials and all sorts of things in. I had no idea what half of it did. Mm -hmm. But they then take you through the ground school, teach you what, uh, uh, how you're going to operate it, and uh, manage to get through that course. And after a, I think it was about 10, or 14, 10 to 14 trips in the two-seat uh, version of these, we went out to America and did the simulator for the GR7 mm -hmm. with the US Marine Corps. Um, oh. So learned how to fly it, came back, and then my first flight in a single seat GR7 was the first time I'd ever sat in a GR7. And, really? Uh, yeah, and, oh, wow. uh, and went flying. Easy to take off, and then you think, oh my God, I've got to land it. 
So that must have been like going from like an old Nokia phone to an iPhone because I heard it had all the digital screens in and everything. Uh, that was the amazing part. Yeah. If, uh, if you point the camera in the GR3 behind us, um, you'll see exactly what I mean about that, the um, cockpit full of switches. But the GR7, um, you know, having come from the GR5, was just an amazing aeroplane yeah. with uh, the full digital displays that had just started coming in. So it was really cutting edge at the time. Yeah. And it was amazing, all menu driven uh, around the cockpit. And the strange thing about it is you still, when you get into it for the first time, don't know what an awful lot of the stuff does mm -hmm. because they haven't needed to teach you to operate it. You're just right. learning how to fly it. So yep. you know what bits of it do. But then there are other things that you go, I wonder what happens if I press that button. <laughs> Fortunately, we didn't press those buttons until we, were, until we learned how to do it. Awesome. So did you ever fly the Harrier in combat? Uh, I flew the Harrier in the, uh, in the Balkans uh, okay. um, over that uh, in you know, the sort of mid to late 90s. Actually, when I, so I finished the conversion unit at Wittering in mid 95, got posted to four squadron out in Germany and when I joined the squadron, they'd already deployed down to Italy and were mm -hmm. actually at that point were bombing over in, uh, in Bosnia. Um, they flew me down there at that point and my very first trip with the squadron was actually in the full combat waistcoat wow. with weapon, all of that sort of stuff. We didn't actually go and drop anything, but uh, there was me over the top of Croatia, Dubrovnik, you know, looking at... So straight uh, in the deep end. <laughs> straight in at the deep end. You know, I, was, I remember being pretty nervous uh, at the <laughs> time, imagine. you know, in my early 20s, yeah. joining the first squadron and being, and being sent out to do that sort of thing. But it was, yeah. the squadron were brilliant in allowing me to do that. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of turned into the peacekeeping mission. So we did an awful lot of time in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Carrying bombs, but just you know, ensuring that things were going right in, mm -hmm. in terms of the uh, the peace process yeah. in that Bosnia area. Mm -hmm. um, so a really, really interesting time. So Paul, how many hours did you get on Harrier, and did you enjoy your time on it? Well, no one in the podcast that we do uh, pilot episodes has ever bantered me about not getting a thousand hours in the Harrier, <laughs> but I got nine hundred and eighty in the end. So close. Uh, yeah, I was close, <laughs> but I realised that hours don't matter. But I had an amazing time. Yeah, I had five years on the aeroplane, ended up as an instructor, a weapons instructor, had been through the uh, uh, the weapons instructor course and uh, loved every minute of it you know it was absolutely cutting edge when I got to it um, and it's an airplane you don't just operate it's such a pleasure to fly as well and difficult to fly in the hover so you'd come back from a sortie then you would do some hovering you mm -hmm. know maybe throw in a bow just to uh, you know just to practice that sort mm -hmm. of stuff you know and your, your heart rate's going so right to the end of the uh, right to the end of the sortie mm -hmm. you were concentrating so I had a fantastic time I loved it I mean before we move on to the F-16 which we're here to chat about I want to see if this is a myth or not are Har Harrier pilots the best pilots <laughs> <laughs> see I'm uh, I'm never going to say they're the best pilots, but uh, you know, the, I, I did all right during flying training, um, and you know, definitely in the with the aeroplane behind us, you had to have your wits about you mm -hmm. in that aeroplane because, as an example, as you decelerate from wingborne flight into hovering flight, you get too much side slip, it's going to roll on its back. Yeah, I heard a few that. more stabilizers and you know a bit more automation in the uh, in the modern Harrier. But uh, yeah, you definitely had to have your wits about it. So, you know, the best pilots, no, because I think the entire um, YouTube world will be on at me uh, for saying that. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you did have to uh, um, um, understand what was going on, mm -hmm. I think. And then something really special happened. You got managed to get an exchange tour with the US Air Force on the F-16. How did this come about and were you picked or did you choose it? As everything with me, I think complete fluke, the right place, right time, <laughs> and uh, decent timing. Um, so I'd, it's one of these things, people sometimes ask me, you know, did I ever want to go into the Red Arrows? Actually, I always wanted an exchange tour because I always wanted to go on to what was then called Eurofighter 2000. Yeah. Uh, and so I knew there had to be some sort of stepping stone yeah. of going and flying a jet somewhere in the world with a radar. So I'd put down F-16, I'd put down US because the US appealed to me and my wife at the time. Uh, she's still my wife, we just didn't have kids, yeah. so I, we didn't have a family. Um, and I was lucky enough to get selected for it. So I was originally selected for uh, what had been an ongoing, uh, an ongoing exchange on the, uh, the Block 40, which was the yeah. multi-role, essentially bomb dropping, targeting pod. Yeah. Um, based up at Hill in Utah, Hill, of, Hill Air Force Base in Utah. And so 
once selected, I went out, I did the training at uh, Luke Air Force Base. It was about halfway through that training that I got the phone call from the embassy that, uh, that told me that I wasn't going to Utah anymore. I was going to South Carolina, which was a bit of a shock. Wow, okay. So what was there, what squadron did you actually end up on? Um, so when I got that phone call, which was interesting in itself because the, uh, the guy from the embassy uh, phoned up and his exact words were, stand up all those who think they're going to Utah, sit down Godfrey. And I went, <laughs> okay, well, where am I going? Yeah. He said, you're going to South Carolina. I went, oh sure, Air Force Base. He said, oh, you know, because it was a, 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 I went through on a, what was called a TX course. So a transition course, not a full B course, you know, so a right, full yeah. student out of training, mm -hmm. which was hard. You know, we can talk about that in a sec. Um, you know, I was definitely in at the deep end and I was going through uh, with a, an F-15 guy who was then converting to the F-16 with the mm -hmm. guards. So there was only two of us on the course, but we kind of were there at the same time as one of the, the bigger courses. And there were a couple of students from that course mm -hmm. who I already knew were going to shore. We talked about this sort of stuff in the, yeah. uh, in the crew room and about the wild weasel, the, the, the role that those Block 50 jets undertook. So when he said you're going to um, South Carolina, it was a kind of mixture of excitement and disappointment. Excitement because I thought, wow, you know, this is going to be really cool. Going on to a uh, the first exchange officer, um, so they'd never had a non-US yeah. pilot fly these things. Um, but then, uh, you know, on a, on a fantastic aeroplane doing that wild weasel roll. But then the disappointment that I wasn't going to be in Utah next to the mountains when the Winter Olympics were on, oh. uh, you know, that year I think was in, uh, in 2000. Um, but chatting with the guys, I already knew about the role, I knew about where the yeah. place was, and so I was really excited, you know, just to be sort of blazing a trail yeah. and going somewhere that, and, and into a role that other people hadn't done. Very lucky indeed, but uh, let's talk a bit about your ground training. What was it like and how did it differ uh, coming, like, you know, from an RAF background? It's a really interesting point because uh, I found it really tricky. I found okay. it difficult. Um, I, you know, there was me, ace of the base, if you like, uh, a weapons instructor on the Harrier. Yeah. And that was a really difficult course. You know, anyone who goes through that weapons instructor course will tell you. Um, you've got to be at the top of your game to, to get through it. You know, by yeah. the end of it, you are probably the best you will ever be oh, really? at operating. It's, right. it's only ever downhill from there. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you know exactly what's going on. I'd spent five years on an aeroplane, knew it inside out, and then suddenly you're transported to a completely different culture for a start. Yeah. Um, language is different. The, the first time I, you know, turned up was, uh, I remember being in um, Subway, and, you know, what do you want to eat? And someone, uh, and I pointed at the, the tuna and said, tuna. <laughs> Sorry, tuna. Sorry, and this went on for about two minutes. And uh, she went chicken. I went no, no tuna. F tuna. Oh, tuna. They couldn't grasp that. You know, and and it's that you know, yeah. uh, it's just the little things. So actually, I'll talk about ground school in a sec. But you know, it was the things when you know when coming to say the right things on the radio and them understanding what was going on. Just the little things like that can sap your capacity. Um, but the ground school itself was reasonably familiar. Um, you know, uh, there was only two of us on it, which was great. And this guy sort of was mentoring me through yeah. some of the more tricky things that I hadn't come across. So as an example, when you're doing the study for your instrument rating, mm -hmm. um, a whole different bunch of rules in American airspace. I didn't get any sort of familiarization okay. with US airspace. I didn't go and to one of their trainers or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, doing that sort of simple stuff. I was straight in at the deep end. So, you know, I remember them plonking about 10 books about this thick on the desk and a study for the instrument rating exam thinking what right. but this guy i was on the course with went hey it's all right i'll talk you through it and you know sort of mentored me through that yeah. process which was really handy yeah. the rest of the training i thought was really really good mm -hmm. you know there'd been a um uh, a multinational training element at luke air force base for a long time mm -hmm. and so they were pretty slick and especially the amount of students there were something like 12 or 13 F-16 squadrons there at Luke, you know, so yeah. the place was unbelievably busy. I heard a stat that it was maybe the fifth most powerful air force in the world on its own. I used Luke to live in Arizona, so I know the power of the place. It's, uh, it was constant aircraft that were going over, so yeah. Uh, uh, just amazing. Um, and so, uh, but the ground school was good, you know, it, because there was only two of us, proper individual lectures, so we got yeah. to understand the, uh, the systems in the aeroplane. Um, Computer-based training as well, so, 
you'd have a lecture and then you'd go off and then um, you know on computer screens you'd run through to make sure you understood it and then they had a mock-up of the cockpit where you could then go and press buttons and make sure you understood how that actually yeah. worked in the aeroplane one of the most amazing things to me though during that ground school period was the ground school instructors who were um, all ex US Air Force guys mm -hmm. almost all of them had flown in Vietnam oh really so the uh, you know so this was 2000 so Vietnam had finished sort of 15 to 20 years previously yeah. so the guys were still you know wow as I'm stood here talking to you that's the same as my Harrier experience yeah. in the 90s so the guys remembered all this sort of stuff and uh, you know one of the guys Bob Harcrow had 2000 hours F4 of which just over a thousand were combat hours in Vietnam. You know, yeah. I spend hours in yeah. the crew room at lunchtime or between lessons or any of these sorts of things, talking to these guys mm -hmm. and just listening to the times. You know, uh, one of them, TJ, who'd been a bombardier in, uh, oh, sorry, a bomb aimer in the B-52 on linebacker raids. Mm -hmm. You know, he had white hair and always said his hair went white when he saw a B-52 just explode out of the sky next to him. You know, and this is recent memory. This is 20 years ago for these guys. It's crazy just when you think about utterly it. utterly amazing. Yeah. You know, so to me, that was brilliant. We were also looked after by uh, a family. He was an instructor of mine as I went through Valley, actually, and he was instructing at Luke, uh, mm -hmm. a guy called Hagar, Ian Hargreaves. And him and Liz were, were just amazing to us. You know, when we arrived in Arizona, just simple things. We couldn't get into our apartment that the, uh, you know, the embassy had squared away for us. So we stayed with them overnight or for the next two nights whilst mm -hmm. it got squared away. So it was a couple of people really looked after so us. So like the little things will help you. Yeah, 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 because it is, if you've lived in Arizona yep. and you've lived abroad, you know it's a culture shock, it you know, totally and that's is. the biggest thing that I don't, you know, we're talking about airplanes here today, but all of that counts to the first time you get in the cockpit and then go and start flying where your capacity is sapped, you know, just inch by inch. Mm -hmm by other things mm -hmm. you know the fact that it's roasting hot you know you've never been that hot walking around an airplane in your life the air conditioning doesn't work until you turn the engine on so i'd sweat <laughs> yeah. most of the fluid out of my body by the time i got into it for the first time mm -hmm. but the ground school really did prepare me and honestly made friends for life you know yeah. in in that area mm -hmm. um it was brilliant so let's talk about your first takeoff in the f-16 and what was it like having reheat or afterburner for the first time it was exciting, you know, just getting into the F-16, even before you power it up, bear in mind it was about 40 degrees on the, uh, <laughs> uh, on the pan at the time. I was amazed at just how good the view from the cockpit was. You know, there's no canopy arcs. When yeah. that canopy comes down, you can see everything. You know, uh, the first trips you do, I think there was sort of two or three in a two-seater first in the d -mod. Yeah. Um, and it's always the same when you, you know, as soon as that canopy comes down on your first sortie, you forget everything that you learned in ground school. Um, you try and remember. And then it, they're very straightforward trips. But um, I remember the kick from the afterburner as we, uh, I, in fact, maybe it wasn't an afterburner takeoff to, to start with. That was maybe on the second trip. Okay. But I remember getting airborne, you know, remembering how to put the wheels up and then forgetting everything. Uh, and when you combine that to, all right, so once you've forgotten everything, all your capacity is sapped out, you revert to talking English, British on the radio as well. So it's the simple things, you know, like you're flying a circuit and, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to overshoot. That mm -hmm. means something completely different in America. So I was confusing them, they were confusing me. And honestly, I landed after that one going, oh my goodness, I'm going to get chopped. I'm not going to be able to do this. But the instructor said, no, you know, that was fine. That's the way... Most people are on their first one, especially the foreign guys yeah. that come through. Um, but an amazing experience, even in that two-seater, to be able to look out of that sort of gold-colored canopy and think, wow, I'm in an F-16. And there's a radar, you know, yeah. I can now see out in front <laughs> yeah. of me. I'm not just reliant on my eyes, which yeah. I was in the Harrier. Mm -hmm. um, so it was brilliant. It was a fantastic moment. So obviously the F-16 has two different engines, the General Electric and the Pratt & Whitney. So which did you fly with? Um, I think... It was the, uh, the General Electric on the, um, I'm trying, you know, I've got difficulty remembering whether it was a Block 25 or a, uh, a Block 30 that I flew going through training on the, uh, on the squadron, the Top Dogs, uh, the uh, 61st, I think it was, mm -hmm. uh, fighter squadron there at Luke. Um, but yeah, but on the base there, there was definitely the, uh, you know, there was the two different uh, mm -hmm. types of engine. Yeah. Um, which was interesting, you know, people used to talk, and F-16 in itself, because there's so many different models, there's so many different overseas models. There was a Singaporean squadron at yeah. Luke when I was there who flew one with the big spine with all the electronic warfare yeah, equipment yeah. in it. 
Um, you'd have big mouth, small mouth, depending on the size of the intake, depending on the, uh, um, the engine that you were flying with. So in, that in itself was quite a confusing world. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, certainly when I got onto the Block 50 um, and did the transition over at, uh, uh, at Shaw Air Force Base, mm -hmm. It was the most powerful engine out there, you yeah. know, and just gave you more grunt than anyone had in a uh, in an F-16. Yeah. Often people will talk about uh, Pratt & Whitney engine on a Block 25 uh, with a big mouth, the big intake, yeah. Yeah. and being a light aeroplane as well, because it hasn't got too much kit in it, being the best BFM machine that you'll ever get before. into. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly um, compared to the Harrier, just having being in an F-16 and fighting BFM was really painful, yeah. and you know was a great experience. Yeah. Um, but it was uh, it was General Electric all the way through for me. Brilliant. So let's talk about some of your uh, training in the air. So what kind of flying would you conduct? Would it be literally air to ground, air to air, or would you uh, practice one mission? It was a building block approach. So mm -hmm. when you, like any ground school, you go through the ground school, you get to the point where you can actually fly the aeroplane. Mm -hmm. You can't necessarily operate the aeroplane at that point. I mentioned it in the Harrier. So you do your first couple of demodel trips where basically they look at your flying, make sure you can do instruments, do an instrument rating. So um, uh, they check you on the ground, make sure you pass your exams. Um, and then you go solo in the aeroplane for the first time, um, which is just flying, which again was amazing. You know, I mentioned when that canopy comes down, you can see everything around you, although I was sweating until the air conditioning <laughs> came on. Um, and actually, I do remember that first solo I did in the F-16. I aligned the inertial nav system in the wrong place, just through a wrong button oh, press. No. So as soon as I got airborne, I was lost <laughs> over the middle of the desert in, uh, in Arizona, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but I found my way back to the airfield and you gradually start to um, uh, increase what you do. And so once you can fly the airplane, you've got your instrument rating, you go straight into uh, basic fighting maneuvers. So 1v1 mm -hmm. dogfighting. And that's the building block approach. So you do air to air first half of the course. Dog fighting, then you go from 1v1 into 2v1, so you've got two of you and a single bandit, yep. and then you graduate to 2v2, mm -hmm. um, which when you do it similar, so two F-16s versus two F-16s, is actually one of the trickiest um, dog fighting maneuvers that you do because A, you, you have to make sure that if you're saddling up and about to shoot someone, they're the right person. Yep. B, you can imagine that two versus two in close proximity, the collision risk is something that you have to look out for. Mm -hmm. So you go into 2v2 um, and then you start getting further apart. So the first thing they then do is called tactical intercepts, mm -hmm. which is you will just fly an intercept and learn to use the radar. Right. Um, so you do ground school on that, then you get into the aeroplane and you fly that. Actually, you fly in all of these, you fly two seat first and then you go out and do it on your mm -hmm. own. Prove you can do it, tick, and then mm -hmm. on to the next one. Uh, so you do tactical intercepts. And from those tactical intercepts, you then start going into what they call ACM. So red and blue, you start at either ends, come together, and you're either intercepting or shooting at range. And if you end up in an intercept on a bogey, that will then develop into a dogfight yeah. after that. Um, and then you terminate once you've finished. So you have this sort of set piece where you've now gone from BFM to uh, tactical intercepts to air combat maneuvering mm -hmm. and then once you've done that with the sort of set piece then you'll go out and fly um, what's called a vol a vulnerability period where they'll just sit 40 minutes and you'll see lots of different red air presentations and okay. you just continually without terminating it in, in between fly that mm -hmm. then once you've done that tick you now onto the next thing which mm -hmm. was air to ground yeah. uh, in the F-16. But let's stay on their DACT or um, air combat maneuvering. How did the F-16 fare against, you know, F-15s or something like that? Was that a good dogfighter? It was an absolutely brilliant dogfighter. Yeah. I I loved it. Mm -hmm. So in my t my whole time out in the states, I ended up uh, flying BFM uh, basic fighter maneuvers against F-15s, uh, F-16s, F-18s, a um, uh, couple of Mirages uh, here or there when we were on deployment. F-15, it would be reasonably straightforward to beat an F-15. Um, it depended on the model of the F-15. Yeah. All of this also depends on the experience of the pilot. Mm -hmm. You know, despite then being a, an experienced pilot, even then, I was still relatively new on the F-16. So, you know, you'd yeah. make mistakes. And actually, I learned everything that I needed to know about air combat, dogfighting mm -hmm. from my time on the, uh, on the F-16, because they were so brutal in the debris. Yeah. You would come back, you'd, uh, for a start, it was a, 
it was a really physically stressful mission mm -hmm. when you're flying BFM because you're pulling up to 9G all the way through, it's warm in the cockpit, you're wearing a lot of gear, yeah. you know, and uh, your neck size does grow when you're I've flying the F-16. Yeah. I mean, it genuinely does. Mm -hmm. I found a photo the other day, and it was my daughter who's 16 now, went, look at that, you look really fat, <laughs> uh, you know, because my neck's out here, because, in the F-6, it's, this sounds strange, but uh, there's no canopy arch, there's no yeah. sort of sides to rest anything on. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking around, you're pulling G, you're, you are holding your head up the whole time. They, they don't tend to fly with the big life jackets that we fly with, yeah. you know, and in our, in our life jackets, you can all, almost cinch up your, your shoulders, yeah. rest your head when you're looking. Mm -hmm. Out there, it is pure neck strength, um, right. you know, so uh, a physically stressful mission. I did a defensive uh, BFM ride where it was pure defensive maneuvers for 45 minutes to an hour. And um, after each set, I was breathing like I just tried to follow your same bolt through the 100 meters. Um, you know, you'd finish, you'd terminate, and you'd be mm -hmm. there going <gasps> in the cockpit, trying to breathe it in, sweat pouring down your face, um, and, you know, trying to just get your heart rate back under control before you go into it again, because you, you're pulling around, you know, starting at long range, you're breaking back into the person, keeping an eye on them, putting flares out when you need to. They start bringing the gun on, you're then going into jinking. Yeah. Um, and they'll, they'll keep going, you know, they'll only terminate when they're sure that you're not gonna give up. Um, you know, so you keep going, you're looking over your shoulder the whole time, you stop, you reset, and then you start again, you go again. But it doesn't, the physical side finishes, but mm -hmm. then it doesn't finish, you know, through the debrief, especially if you're leading this, so when you go through the flight lead workup, you're then expected to, uh, you sync up the radar tapes, the head-up display tape, and the yep. situational awareness uh, tape. We put all these tapes into the machines. You have a whiteboard in front of you and your pens, and you were expected, especially when you went through the flight lead upgrade, or an instructor pilot upgrade, to be able to draw every single engagement on the board from start to finish in all of the right directions, you know, even accounting for alpha on the aeroplanes. Um, and to cut from overhead views to side views if that's what was required. Manage the board space. So if you had nine engagements, you'd have to start up there and you know, make sure you had nine slots that you could draw this stuff in. To the point where you know, a standard marker pen, that long, is 3,000 feet. So when you're starting it, you do you know, a yeah. 9,000 foot set. Uh -huh. And when you are in that level of detail, and to the point that you know you're supposed to be able to look at a board and it then should look like an overhead view of ex mm -hmm. exactly what you flew you really uh, start to understand why you're flying the maneuvers that you're flying and how you could have flown them better you know so it was a really 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 good schooling in that basic fighter maneuvers and all because the F-16 was such a BFM machine. It was designed as a day yeah, VFR fighter, yeah. you know, guns and heaters only. Mm -hmm. You know, it was only later on that they uh, upgraded it and did all the fancy things that they've done with it that have made it such a great aeroplane. And you can tell it's a success. I mean, it's still going today, and I think they're bringing uh, out unbelievable. Like I, I genuinely think it's one of the most successful. It has to be for over uh, uh, five thousand built. It uh, has to be yeah, one of the point. most uh, successful fighters Definitely. on the planet ever. Yeah. Um, it, it flies good, easy to fly. Um, and is good in all of those different environments. Mm -hmm. But you actually flew the F-16 in the wild uh, weasel role. Can you tell our viewers what this role is? So wild weasel was uh, a term that was coined in, back in Vietnam. Um, and this was with the advent of radar laid anti-aircraft artillery and surface to air missiles. Um, the wild weasel role was a, uh, the guys that would go in Initially, it was to tempt these rockets off of the rails, uh, you know, so they knew where the, uh, where the uh, areas were. But then they started adding jamming pods and that sort of thing. So these guys would go in and jam um, and, uh, you know, to allow the packages of other aircraft to fly by without getting shot down by these surface to air missiles. And it, then it developed into um, Shrike and anti-radiation missiles. So they mm -hmm. developed these missiles with seeker heads that allowed a, uh, you, know, you to shoot against these radars that were then up and looking at you. Um, so it kind of developed from there. Um, a really sophisticated role and one that I was really excited to get into at Shaw. You know, the F-16 Block 50, as it was, was set up for this with a harm targeting system hung off the right-hand side underneath the fuselage. 
Um, and then you would carry uh, harm missiles, the high-speed anti-radiation missiles, which were enormous. They look you know, huge. <laughs> they, they, I mean, they look big on the aeroplane. When you see one in the wild on its own, you know, <laughs> just sat there waiting to be loaded, it yeah. is like a telegraph pole. They're yeah. massive missiles. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a really exciting role to be, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to be part of. Mm -hmm. So, what would you say the F-16's strengths and weaknesses were? Um, oh, I, you know, its strengths were that it could do any mission. You know, it was built to do any mission from the Block 20s all the way up through the Block 50s and now into Block 50s, you talked about the 70s. The way that it could be upgraded, the, um, you know, the fact that it went from a day VFR, Visual Flight Rules Fighter, to um, using the radar with AMRAAM missiles, harm targeting systems, targeting pods, bombs. It could carry a lot as well. You know, the, although it looks like it's got small wings, the whole of the, the body is a part of the lifting body. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the strength is its flexibility. It really is. Uh, one of the missions that I ended up doing uh, when we deployed to Iraq the first time round, uh, which was just after, uh, just prior to um, September the 11th, in fact, I was over there when September the 11th happened, yeah. um, was we'd follow the U-2 around um, and we'd be its seed escort, its suppression of oh, enemy really? air defense escort. Wow, okay. So we'd zigzag behind around lower, clearly, a lot lower than them. <laughs> and we'd be there, if anything tried to light up the, uh, the U-2, we'd be there to, uh, to shoot our, our harms at it. I know that, right. At the same time, there'd be F-16s with bombs on, waiting to do any uh, you know, bombing that yeah. was required in that area. Um, and uh, uh, you know, there'd be F-16s that are in the, if they weren't bombing, they'd be in the fighter role as well. Yeah. You know, so you've got such a flexible airplane doing a bunch of different missions mm -hmm. you know, in the same area. Mm -hmm. We often worked with the Eagle, so they were just doing their pure air-to-air -air stuff. All we'd, the seas, yeah. Yeah, so as a CJ, we'd follow them in close to them because we had a, uh, an air-to-air -air capability, obviously, but yeah. we could also, if there were any SAM traps, so that, yeah. you know, they're being lured into any surface-to-air um, missile sites, we could, uh, you know, we could shoot them first and hopefully save mm -hmm. these guys as well. Um, so a brilliant, brilliant aeroplane. Mm -hmm. In terms of weaknesses... Um, is it fair to say, is it um, jack of all trades, master of none? I've heard that term before, I don't know if it's fair. Well, I, the thing is though, I don't know, so what would you count, I guess, if you, so if you take the A-10 as the master of close air support, yeah. um, it's a vulnerable aeroplane in an air-to-air war. It is, yeah. You know, so I think there is a, there's a huge positive in being a jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think very few weaknesses in the, in the F-16. You know, mm -hmm. It can carry quite a lot of, uh, of missiles and, aircraft, and bombs for, for such a small yeah. airplane. So it packed a punch. Yeah. Um, you know, subsequently, uh, having come back to the, the Typhoon, which was like an F-16 on steroids, <laughs> um, I guess, you know, like getting into a, uh, you know, a Bugatti Veyron compared to a, a uh, a sort of small NG sports car, yeah. um, you know, maybe it is weapons hard points. Uh, to me at the time, just with the model I was flying, uh, it was a lack of a continuous data link, you know, uh, yeah. a Link 16. But that's subsequently been fixed on yeah. all of them. They've all had the upgrades, so they've all got data link. They've all got, you know, various um, uh, upgrades. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't think, I genuinely don't think there are many weaknesses there. Okay. And what was it like having the side stick coming from a center stick in the Harrier? I wondered what it was going to be like. Um, side stick itself is quite a natural way to sit. So is it really? You fly okay. the simulator before you go flying in the first place. And so you've got used to it by then. And the, the one thing I would say about the F-16 is actually one of its strengths is, I, you know, I've flown a few aeroplanes, but I think the world's best hands-on throttle and stick switchology. So, you know, tons of switches on the throttle and stick, but everything was so intuitive in the cockpit as to what you had to do. Whatever weapon you had selected from an AMRAAM to a HARM to a Maverick to a bomb, you were doing the same switch selections, and so you would never get it mixed up. Yeah. Um, so much so that actually that's the same switchology they use in the F-35 as well. And I got in the F-35 yeah. simulator for the first time, I went, I know this. The actual stick itself, when I was used to a stick moving around yeah. in the cockpit, actually was quite stiff so there wasn't a lot of movement it was more pressure than actual movement and so that was a little strange to get used to so the first time you do an approach in the real airplane you find yourself sort of yeah. just hunting very slightly 
but then it takes one trip um, yeah. or maybe one approach and you're over it and it feels like the most natural thing in the world yeah. and it gives you you know so they're especially your sitting position between the legs you know room for more instrumentation uh, for your lunch you know that sort of thing yeah. um, so I, I you know I thought I didn't know what it was going to be like but it felt natural to me mm -hmm. um, the thing I think I was most worried about in a Harrier when you land um, you, you tend to power up because you're cushioning the landing um, yeah. because the nozzles are pointing down I was having to go back to an aeroplane where I was closing the throttle to land again mm -hmm. uh, you know as you came into land yeah um, but again uh, I got used to that very quickly because yeah. it was kind of ingrained through training of course yeah and being a Brit in the US here what was that like was there much banter between uh, you and the guys and yeah the tons it was utterly brilliant uh, you know I I I absolutely loved my time going through training there and then on, a, on the squadron and you know the squadron was so tight people changed the, the whole time yeah. but it's like being on a sports team, you know, with a really, really, really good cohesive atmosphere. And the fact that you go into combat together, you know, creates a bond with the guys that like no other. I can imagine. Um, so, you know, Iraq the first time, September the 11th happened out there. That was an amazing thing to go through. I was the authorizing officer on the desk on the morning of September 11th, 2001. Mm -hmm. And uh, our engineering officer, she came running in and said, have you seen the TV? A light aeroplane has gone into one of the Twin Towers. So we turned the TV on, looking about that. They're talking about this light aeroplane going in. Then we see the next one mm -hmm. go in. Oh my goodness. Um, so going through that with them, we were then back in the US, I think it was about two weeks later, two or three weeks later, seeing, feeling what it was like in the US at that yeah. point. Um, and then myself, I was involved in some of the, uh, the missions over the top of Washington DC. So until yeah. they found out a Brit was flying, uh, I was flying combat air, fully armed combat air patrols over the top of Washington DC. I think you, you know, talked about it in one of the podcasts actually. Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, just utterly amazing. Seeing the sun come up on Thanksgiving morning, DC is completely quiet. And there I am actually on that particular day talking to a Belgian uh, controller on a NATO AWACS <laughs> over the mainland USA. Uh, it, just unbelievable. So experiences like that really, really, really bonded um, you know the the team that we had yeah. a large squadron larger than a than a UK squadron yeah. would be but a brilliant bunch of guys mm -hmm. and then we went out uh, to Iraq again we were actually flying from Turkey as the uh, second Gulf War started mm -hmm. in in 2003 so uh, some amazing missions that we ended up in that area actually when the war itself started the Turks wouldn't let us fly so uh, you know we ended up yeah. um, uh, sitting down and, and not getting involved in the war and it was our sister squadrons from our base that mm -hmm. did but the six month build up to that had just been unbelievably interesting, uh -huh. uh, you know, with all sorts of stuff going on. Yeah. So, um, you know, for me, it was a really formative time in my life. It yeah. was, uh, I'd always had my own view of what the USAF were gonna be like. It was nothing like that. You know, they were the most professional and skilled bunch of pilots that I'd come across. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying the Harrier Force wasn't at all, but when you got the F-16, the flexibility it brings and the ability to be able to do close air support, suppression of enemy air defences, um, defensive counter air, offensive counter air um, and uh, just, you know, regular OCA bombing and stuff like that. That's an amazing aeroplane and you need to con continuously practice those skill sets yeah. to be good at them. Mm -hmm. You know, your point about jack of all, master of none. Yeah, yeah. But an awesome bunch of guys and girls and, uh, you know, I loved every minute of it. Yeah, it sounds like you had a brilliant time, but uh, how many hours did you get on F-16 when you were uh, It was uh, around about 600, um, you know, which, uh, <laughs> yeah, which I was pretty happy with, actually. Yeah. Clearly got a plaque for that one, no badges. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, and we had uh, one of the guys on the, on the squadron that I, I was on over at shore. Uh, I think he got, he recently, or the, definitely a few years ago, got 5,000 hours on the F-16, you know, just been there forever. He was one, I was telling the story the other day where he was at Luke Air Force Base, had ejected out of a two-seat F-16, and um, they had the command eject set wrong. So the way that they came out, the student's seat box ended up firing through his chute. Um, and Brian's chute then candled, and it, that, he thought that was it. He thought he was going to fall out of the sky and you know, end up as a mess on the ground. But he ended up with more forward speed because the chute candled. He then got wrapped, his chute uh, lines got wrapped around the guy in front and they both came down on a single I'm parachute. I'm just hearing the story. <laughs> amazing.